Hello, hello, hello. I'm Brian. I'm the pastor here at Christ United Methodist Church, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is a pre-recorded session that will be you'll be able to view, of course, that or that you are viewing, I guess I should say. <clears throat> um, well, the good thing about that is there, I know there's no hesitation. I know I'm live right away, so to speak, and uh, don't have that pause at the beginning. It feels a little awkward sometimes. Anyway, thank you for uh, for tuning in. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad that you're you're doing that as we journey through the book of Acts. Um, and although this isn't live, you can still leave comments here uh, on on this video and uh, I will be reading those at some point and get back to you um, whatever kind of comments you want to make if the if you've been struck by something and you want to you know share about that or if you have a question you can also leave the question there and again I will get back to you sorry I can't do this one live but uh, as I mentioned I've got a, a meeting that I have to be at at the same time so I didn't want to interrupt though the uh, our rhythm here with nine o'clock, nine o'clock, nine o'clock. So we're going to get right to it, uh, not waste a lot of time. I've already wasted a minute and a half. We're going to jump right into Acts chapter 11. This is our, this is day 11 of our journey through the book of Acts. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, no. Sorry. I meant chapter 12. I meant chapter 12. I meant chapter 12. And it reads, About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This, place, this took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Pause. So this isn't, this isn't Herod the Great, who was uh, ruler of that area, governor, whatever you want to call him, uh, Tetrarch, during Jesus's time, okay? Uh, this would have actually been the two Herods after him, two Herods after him, because uh, after Herod the Great, there was another Herod, can't remember what his name was, but then there came Herod Agrippa, okay? So he's the third one. Now, uh, the historian Josephus uh, tells us a little bit about, about Herod Agrippa, says he was very violent and capricious, uh, he did things on whims, uh, but usually very violent things on whims. So it does not say what he was upset about, uh, why he wanted to, uh, why he arrested and killed James. Now this would have been James, one of Jesus's 12, one of the 12 apostles. Um, it doesn't say why doesn't say why. doesn't even say why he began to persecute the church at all. Um, but uh, but he did. So it could be just because of, like Josephus says about him, he was violent and capricious. For whatever reason, he killed James with a sword. Now, since, and since it says James, the brother of John, it would have been, you know, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So he's that James. He's that James. There's different things to think about here, uh, several important things to, to talk about, consider. Uh, the fact that he's killed with a sword. Um, we presume uh, that, that they mean uh, beheading. That's, that's probably the better choice, rather than thinking he was just stabbed or uh, uh, disemboweled with a sword. Those would be rather gross and disgusting and uh, more torturous for the individual. If, as as bad as a beheading is, it's probably at least slightly more humane than than one of those other choices might be. So let's hope that that's what happened to uh, to Brother James to Saint James. The thing is that type of execution was 
was reserved for very, very specific crimes, uh, very rarely used, neither of which, uh, James was not guilty of the crimes that would normally be considered legal or okay uh, as far as justification for, for execution through beheading. Um, so again, it's kind of another way of, uh, of Luke saying that James is, is a prophet like Jesus in the fact that he's being treated illegally by the, by the system. Um, they're, they're not doing things the way they should. But then he goes ahead and he arrests Peter because he, he sees that the Jews like it, that the Jewish people like it. Um, it seems, it seems that uh, Peter has had a little bit of a fall in popularity. Uh, Peter was quite popular amongst amongst individuals. In the past, he's only come into trouble with the Jewish hierarchy, uh, the Sanhedrin and the the count the various councils and the the priests at the temple. Uh, but now, uh, apparently, anyway, um, he he's no longer liked very much by the Jewish people in Jerusalem at all. Hard to say, hard to say. Could be still that they're just talking about the hierarchy. Uh, but it seems like it's more than just that. It seems like it's more than just that. The other thing that this and that this whole thing uh, sets up, uh, with James's execution in particular, is the uh, the breakup of the Twelve, I guess we might say. the So far, there's been the circle of the Twelve. There's the Twelve Apostles um, who were the key leaders of the time. And remember, when Judas committed suicide, um, one of the, you know, they, they replaced him. They, they don't replace James. They don't replace James. So we can see that it's the beginning of the breakup and new leadership then must be uh, taking over. Okay. And it's, so it's rather than just the 12, we're going to have, I, I'm going to say we're, we're sort of like, we're going to start to see a multiplication of apostles and a multiplication of of uh, of these disciples and preachers leading the church in Jerusalem and beyond and beyond. Now Peter is is also arrested. Peter is arrested during Passover and imprisoned during Passover, and uh, Herod is going to hold him until Passover is done. Um, now, we, we don't know for sure. It says bring him out for public trial. It would be a sham. He's going to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Luke, although he doesn't specify, you get the you get the hint. You get the feeling it's going to be a sham trial. He's mostly going to bring Peter out of uh, prison to execute him. Can you see the very see with the, some of the similarities coming up here to show that Peter most definitely is a prophet like Jesus. He is arrested. It's Passover time. Um, and, uh, you know, all the all the good rules that the leaders are keeping, um, you know, not wanting to do things publicly and, uh, and really upset people. And everything's very underhanded. And uh, in spite of all that, they're, they're keeping to the religious rules. They don't want to do it during Passover. Or, or Herod doesn't want to do it during Passover. Passover. And the church prayed very earnestly for him. <clears throat> the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Pause. Luke is saying, you know, it's an impossible situation. It's an impossible situation. He's double chained. Uh, he's sitting right between two guards. There's guards just outside of, of every door, every you know escape possibility, including the main gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. Your translation might say tapped. Well, let's say tapped is probably better than struck him on the side. I'm going to say that anyway. Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me. 
the angel ordered. So get up, get dressed, get going, <laughs> is what the angel tells him. Follow me. So Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city, and this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. Pause. Uh, again, Luke is setting something up. There's an interesting uh, wordplay that he's using, a literary, nice literary device in here. Because, uh, you know, he, yes, it's this miraculous le leaving, uh, this miraculous escape, getting out of prison. The gate opens up for him miraculously when he finally comes to his head after he's been in a, he believes he's been in a, a trance, uh, a vision. Uh, he, uh, now he's by himself and he's going on. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from the Jewish leaders had planned, and from what, sorry, from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do with me, to me. Apologies, eyes not working very well. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. Pause. Uh, just Luke, remember from our discussion on Luke, women are are women are high up in in Luke's thinking they're very important and uh, he he uses women a lot in his stories he hasn't done that a whole lot here in Acts but this is here's one here's one um, so we've got and he, he even names her it's her house it's her house doesn't mention her husband or anything uh, the, the idea of a woman owning property in first century was rather rare if at all. Uh, so uh, he's naming her and mentioning her son, who uh, is going to be mentioned, you know, who will uh, will become a character in the stories uh, as we move along. Um, but he mentions her. He's also going to mention another woman. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. Pause. Here's where that literary device that I was talking about. Peter uh, had to go through a gate to get away from the, the prison. Now he's got to go through another gate to enter the house and to enter their property. Uh, and it's interesting that the one miraculously opened, but this one he has to knock on. I think this is kind of funny, actually, myself, that uh, the, the one that should have been unopenable was, was wide open. And the one that Peter wants to go through and you would think would be open is the one that's locked and he has to knock on the gate. He knocked at the gate, uh, the door of the gate, and a servant woman named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. Pause. Now, uh, Go back in your memory. Does that sound like anything? Does that sound like anything? To me, it sounds like the stories of uh, Jesus' resurrection, how, uh, in particular, in John, John chapter 20, how uh, Mary Magdalene recognized Jesus by his voice. Recognized Jesus by his voice. And what happened when she and when the other women uh, went back to tell the disciples that Jesus wasn't in the, the tomb anymore or that Jesus was, ris was risen, that they'd seen him, right? What was their reaction? What was their reaction? Continuing 15, you're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Pause. Again, she wrote as getting the same kind of reaction that that Mary and, and the other women got with uh, Jesus' resurrection. So, uh, again, Luke is really pointing, and he's kind of hammering away at this thought that Peter is a prophet like Jesus. A prophet like Jesus. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down 
and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said, and then he went to another place. Pause. Pause. Now, you might be confused. Might be confused, because wait a minute. James was executed, right? Different James. Different James. Now, first of all, there were two Jameses in amongst the twelve, right? There was James, the brother of John, and then there was James the Less, uh, or James the Lesser, whichever you want to phrase it. But this isn't either of them. Uh, we, we, we're, we believe, we think, or uh, we're fairly sure that he's talking about James, the brother of Jesus, um, who we, again, we think, we believe, wrote the book of James, but who was uh, a, a respected and higher up in the, uh, the early church there in Jerusalem, okay? And he was started off, I mean, he was probably like a pastor of a home church, but by this point was coming up in the uh, in in the in the hierarchy so to speak and peter says tell him all about this this moment although it's small just those few words it would be easy to kind of pass over it but it's a very important few words it's a very important statement uh, because through it what 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 luke is saying is Peter is passing over his authority. He's hand, handing over the authority that he has had in Jerusalem, in, in the early church, and he's handing it over to James. He's, he's passing the baton. From here on in, uh, throughout the rest of Acts, Peter... I think only makes one more appearance no, and not that it's not an important one because it is but uh, James begins to play a bigger role in, in the book of Acts especially in Jerusalem and James plays a bigger role in in history in Jerusalem just beyond beyond just Acts okay so it's just that key thing just that, those few words tell James and the other brothers what happened and then he went to another place. He went to another place. He, uh, he moved away. He moved away. We, it's Luke saying we're not going to hear much more from him. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him. When he couldn't be found, because he was out of town, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea to stay in Caesarea for a while. Pause. Uh, in other words, he's really showing where his allegiance lies. He's leaving Judea and he's going back to Caesarea, which would have been the Roman capital of that whole region. Okay, he's going back to the Roman city rather than staying there in, uh, in Jerusalem or in Judea in any way, shape, or form. Continuing, now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Luke doesn't say why. So they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, It's the voice of, of a god, not of a man. Pause. So, although Luke, Luke doesn't say why he was upset with uh, Tyre and Sidon, why, he, why Herod was upset with these places, um, but he tells us they're, they're going to try to be as contrite and po as possible, work with with. Herod as much as they can. Why? Because they relied on him for food. They relied on him for food. So Herod is not as willing to share the food of his land uh, with these others as the, the church is, as part of that community of, of shared goods. Remember, that that's actually an important thing for Luke. Uh, and it, even when it's not truly explicit and, and specified, it's there. It's there. It's implicit in some of these stories. Um, and we're going to hear again 
remember uh, Barnabas and uh, Saul were, were taking foodstuffs from Antioch down, down to Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, because of the this shared goods community. But Herod is, is, doesn't want to even share with these people at all. And he's trying to hold a grudge against them. When he gives, grants them a, an audience and uh, he puts on his royal robes, which he really wasn't king, you know, because they're still part of the Roman Empire. But he puts on these royal robes, sits on a throne, and uh, makes this grand speech to them in order to be contrite, in order to try to uh, to appease Herod as much as they can, they give him a great ovation and shout, Oh, it's the voice of a god, not of a man. Hyperbole? Probably. But uh, th that's what they're trying to do. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with words and died. Pause. Uh, <laughs> a standard, standard uh, literary technique is for the vile and tag, in order to have a happy ending anyway, is to have the vile antagonist die at the end of the story. And the worse of a death, the better. The, the worse of a death, the better. It's a, it, was a, it was, and I would say continues to be, a standard literary device um, to have that happy ending. We could, I could point to hundreds of different movies where a similar thing, you know, a similar technique, the death of the vile antagonist, uh, helps promote a happy ending. Now, although I can, I can point to a whole bunch of them, you know which one I'm going to go to, right? Star Wars. <laughs> Episode 6, Return of the Jedi. And no, you might think oh, I'm going to talk about the death of Darth Vader, but no, because by that point, he had uh, encountered redemption. But the Emperor, the Emperor is truly the vile antagonist of, of that story in that movie. And it is his death, or at least presumed death, <clears throat> being thrown down that shaft. Uh, that is, th that helps to provide for the happy ending. And again, can tell it could tell that from uh, hundreds of different movies and stories and books and all that. And, and the point is, especially at the time, the more disgusting, the more graphic the death, the better. The better. And so we have Herod being consumed by worms. Luke is, he, he wouldn't have been the first one. Um, it's actually a couple couple echoes that uh, Luke's original audience would have would have recognized um, from uh, from the Maccabean time period Antiochus Antiochus Epiphanes the uh, fourth or the fifth whatever it was uh, was consumed by worms and I think it's in I Isaiah there's a reference to your enemies will be eaten by worms so um, but so it's it's providing the happy ending to the story by getting rid of the vile antagonist. And what happens? Continuing 24. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. Um, pause. Or, well, end of chapter. They returned. I'm not sure uh, where, you know, uh, I think it says in other translations that they returned to Jerusalem. They returned to Jerusalem. Uh, others, they, others, other translations may say they returned from Jerusalem, which probably makes a little bit more sense and meaning that, probably meaning that they went back to uh, the Antiochian area, back up to Antiochus. Okay, uh, but that's the end of that. And see, there's John Mark. John Mark is making a, a, a further appearance. Um, and he begins, you know, we'll talk about John Mark a little bit uh, in future chapters as well. He's not a major role, um, but he's, he, is, uh, he is in there. 
he, he is a character in the story. Anyway, folks, thank you again for joining me for day 11, for day 11, for chapter 11, and I hope that you have a blessed day. Bye.